um, for all of you who are new in the room. Um, uh, just so you know, Unrehearsed Futures has started off as a response to the pandemic where we were just asking ourselves questions of, well, what the hell are we doing as drama schools? Uh, you know, I had a separate conversation with Sarah, a separate conversation with somebody from um, the University of, uh, Institute of Arts in Barcelona, from Oxford Drama School, and I realized everyone was saying the same things. I was trying to figure out what, what we as a drama school here in Mumbai needed to do. And... Uh, and then what happened as a result of that is we, we just realized that there were common conversations that we could all have together. So we started to have these conversations. They were aptly named Unrehearsed Futures by my amazing communications director back at the time. Uh, and after curating eight or nine of them back to back, I was like, I can't curate at this rate. And we were joined by the lovely Amy Russell from Embodied Poetics, who created a beautiful second uh, half of the first season called Responsibility. And then... The second season, the conversation, of course, expanded to a much wider scope than what do drama schools do. And it was this idea of what is theater's response to this ever-changing, ever-disruptive future? And what can we do? And lots of amazing ideas and conversations have started to happen. A lot of healthy navel-gazing, but almost to the <laughs> point of now we feel like we are at a place that there, there's almost a palpable sense in the room of in this ongoing conversation that that there is something here that that one can turn from thought into impulse and i think we're on the cusp of that as we hit this 11th talk um so just in case you want to have your mind blown the way Mine has been blown. I feel like I've come back to school with these classes, with these talks. Uh, and um, all of these talks are live. They're all available on the Unrehearsed Futures website, which is at the Drama School Mumbai website. There's a page called Conversations. Every talk is recorded there. Falguni Rao, who's managing this affair, uh, also writes amazing reportage pieces after each talk and those get put up in case you want to do a five page read instead of listening to a one hour talk. But there is a really solid dynamic amount of knowledge, thought and information out there that really does spark the imagination further. And I hope you guys will all enjoy it. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to my curator in crime, Mgeni. Hello, thank you, Jehan. Hi, folks. Lovely to see you all here again. Um, it's a rather cold evening in Cape Town, which is why I'm wearing a giant scarf and I may look overdressed to you in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and at an unusual time for us, normally we do the 10 o'clock in the morning slot, but we are in the evening today. And I am joined for tonight's discussion by Sarah Matchett, um, who is a colleague of mine at the University of Cape Town in the CCDPS. She's our director. Um, she is also one of the founding members of um, the Mother Tongue Project, who you hear a little more about later on. Um, I'm also joined by Phoebe Kisubi um, from the African Gender Institute, also at the University of Cape Town, who has been doing work with Sarah um, and Phoebe, sorry, not Phoebe, pardon me, Yaluya Clark, also from the African Gender Institute, um, who is having a bit of a technical problem, but will join us as soon as she's able to. Um, who are all working collectively on the Global Grace Project, which is an international project um, that Phoebe, I believe, is going to briefly introduce to us um, in a second. Um, I, or Sarah, I'm not going to throw anybody under any buses quite yet, um, but I guess thinking about the conversation we had last week, which was, you know, really robust and we were trying to kind of think through the nuts and bolts of what this work that we are envisaging in this particular forum might look like, what it means, and, and kind of arriving at a recognition perhaps that we need to think in more concrete terms around what it is we hope to produce in this, um, I guess, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, this almost utopian kind of moment where we're reaching for a sense of planetarity of possibility and plurality as the grounding for a kind of ethics for thinking into the future. It just so happens that the topic that we're going to be discussing tonight anyway is around this relationship between performance and social justice work. And so the project that our three kind of um, initiating interlocutors uh, work on, as we'll hear in, in a second, uses performance as a way of, of beginning to engage with, with um, communities, quote unquote, at the margins 
Um, and I'm going to hand over to, ah, Yali was there as well. Yali has now joined us. Hello, Yali O'Clark. Um, yeah, so if, if, if one of the Global Grace folks wouldn't mind just giving us a, a quick introduction to what the project is, what it seeks to do, and the kinds of um, problems that it, 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 it kind of seeks to engage in, and then we'll hopefully move quite swiftly on into a discussion of um, the kind of various questions that emerge out of that space. Phoebe, Sarah, Yaliwe, who's going to take the hook? <laughs> I propose Yaliwe. <laughs> <laughs> Yaliwe just settled technically into the room, but Yaliwe will try. <laughs> I am here. If there's anything I miss, uh, Phoebe and Sarah, please, please step in. Um, yes, so this Global Grace Project, as, it, as the words imply, it is global. It is actually involving uh, 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 communities of researchers and activists uh, uh, across, I think it's five continents. Um, so we've got uh, a team here in South Africa, of which uh, Sarah, me, and Phoebe are part of. There's a team in Bangladesh, Brazil, the Philippines, Mexico, and uh, in UK. And I'll talk a little bit about each as well. But overall, um, it's a project that does something interesting. It looks uh, uh, firstly at equality um, as a cultural artifact. Yeah, so each of us investigates the various ways that equalities are made, but also contested in different parts of the world. And the other thing it does is it looks at the ways in which cultures might best be understood as practices through which people create the worlds in which we habit, inhabit. So we investigate how people's creative practices challenge inequality and also engender new possibilities for more equitable ways of living together. Um, and it, and it's, it's tough work. I mean, it, each, of, each of the teams uh, tries to really be creative in also recognizing people's, uh, what they, we call it people's hard won achievements in terms of this ongoing struggle of what it means to live on the margins of economies, on the margins of social systems. Um, and, and each of the projects works with people who kind of live in, in very uh, difficult uh, circumstances. So the teams, um, we, we're gonna be talking about our team that works very closely with a group of sex workers that are part of an NGO here in South Africa called the Sex Workers Advocacy and Task, Education and Task Team, SWEAT which is an NGO that has for many, many years, I forget how many now, but has been pushing for uh, the rights, legal rights of sex workers to practice sex work. So they push very strongly for decriminalization of sex work. Um, and they do that, they push for it, uh, yes, in the very typical ways, you know, inputting into legal processes, pushing uh, government officials, members of parliament to discuss legal, uh, legal uh, systems and how, how the law needs to change, but also have been very creative in pushing uh, uh, for the destigmatization of sex work and looking at sex work as work. And, and there they've, they've created some very interesting forms of what they call creative activism. So with us as a team, it's, uh, uh, we partnered with this group of sex workers which is now, which is a uh, well-functioning, quite large NGO. When you think of how NGOs are in terms of size, I think they're quite big in terms of staffing and network of, of sex workers on the continent and also in, in South Africa. We work with that team and we as myself and Phoebe located at the African Gender Institute and Sarah at the Center for Theater, Dance and Performance Studies. And we call our, we've, we call our, what we call work package or research uh, project. It's called Participatory, Participatory Theater and the Production of Cultures of Equality among Sex Workers in South Africa. We'll talk more about that. Bangladesh, uh, the team in Bangladesh looks at uh, what they call working women in men's world. So they're looking at female construction workers, visualizing the work of female construction workers, really working on uh, in a, in a very uh, male-dominated masculine space and what it means to 
to work on the margins, yes, of a male dominated, actually particular kind of economic uh, system. Brazil looks at uh, what they're calling decolonizing knowledge and masculinities. And they're looking at that through street art, dance, um, and dance in the favelas in Brazil. So in the informal uh, uh, urbans, uh, uh, very densely populated, uh, quite militarized uh, uh, in terms of the way the government responds to favelas, but also the kinds of violences in the favelas. Um, so their, their entry is street art and dance in terms of um, the, uh, the way in which they're looking at equality as an artifact. The Philippines looks at um, what they call making life lovable and they're looking at digital and literary productions of equality amongst LGBTQ young people in the Philippines. And they're, they're working a lot with poetry, engaging with poetry. Uh, mostly, I think I would say amongst gay men, but maybe that would have changed um, uh, over the years. We haven't been interacting closely due to COVID. Mexico looks at uh, creating cultures of equality through the migrant museum, they call Mumi and they work with indigenous communities of the Chiapas in Mexico. Very interesting because they're taking the museum away from this, you know, the way we usually think of museums, you know, this formal structure, you know, that uh, collects artifacts and puts them on display separate from the communities from whence they came. They actually create the museum in the midst of the communities, the indigenous communities they work with, and they focus on migrancy, actually, uh, the way in which people migrate and how that has actually a certain kind of migrancy created by uh, capitalist uh, corporate industry and how it has created uh, certain kinds of migrant labor in the Chiapas. So that's, that's a really interesting one. And uh, United Kingdom UK looks at what they call space invading, curatorial practice and the making of the Global Museum of Equality. And they look at critiquing the mainstream museum, particularly those in the global north in UK and how that museum is actually implicated in colonial histories, ongoing colonial histories, I would argue. A lot of the artifacts from the uh, former British colonies are still sitting in these museums and really about you know, contesting that space and alternative narratives for that. And each of the projects is also contributing to a museum, like a display of, of the creative pieces we have uh, uh, made, we have co-created in each of our teams and to have those pieces in conversation with each other was the plan and then COVID habit happened. So we're trying to see how we can actually put them in one space online. Um, that was a mouthful. Um, did I miss anything, but Sarah and Phoebe, please? A beautiful mouthful. A really rich and rigorous mouthful. We love a mouthful. Um, okay. Thank you, Yaliwa. And Sarah and Phoebe, by all means, you know, feel free to, to kind of um, step in here um, if you have anything to add. But I guess one of the things that excites me and strikes me about the Global Grace Project and the Global Project itself, right, as it's conceived, is that in all of these kind of different sites where these different, I guess, research groups are working, art or what you're calling creative activism seems to be the undergirding impulse, right? That is driving a lot of these um, interventions either into a kind of structures of, of inequality um, or institutions that sustain those structures. So it strikes me on the one hand, and, and you know, we can, we can pass this any number of ways, that um, firstly, there's, there's some kind of value that is being recognized around creative practice as a way of intervening, speaking back to somehow responding to these kind of global structures by which or in which we are all entangled. Um, there's a slight irony there as well, right? Is that we certainly are all in institutions. Um, we arrive at this work via our institutional connections, via those kinds of networks. And it's, 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 of no small irony to me, or rather the irony is not last, that in some ways we're kind of using or thinking about creative activism as a way of engaging institutional critique. And in the same moment are still engaged within the politics, the frameworks, I guess maybe the ontology, right, of, of, of having to work within these kind of institutional structures or frameworks. So I guess as a, prov a provocation, a question to ask, 
I'm wondering whether we can talk a little about how we perceive that relationship and how it may reproduce certain kind of forms of power or reify them. And then more importantly, what kinds of alternatives, performance or the use of creative kind of activism, I'm going to use that term now, um, kind of allows us to, to um, what kind of alternatives performing or, or working creatively allows us to imagine, right? And also as a secondary question is, is the degree to which we feel that that practice of imagining may be sufficient given the size and scale of the problems that face the people with whom we work, generally also outside of those communities. So there's that relationship as well, right? It's about our points of access to these spaces too. I already have um, two questions or comments in the chat, one from Jehan. The idea of creative practice being an essential part of healthy social practice is so important. How do we make it ubiquitous? What do you mean by ubiquitous though, Jehan? I, uh, it just goes back to my, how do we make it understood by, it, it's part of the bigger quest that I have, which is how do, mm -hmm. I, how do, we, how do we make it where, where just, where everyone is understands the role of creativity in finding voice, building community, speaking back to power, all of those things. So when I'm talking about it, it's, it shouldn't be in the hands of just people who have trained in creativity or who have had access to or have the capacity for creative expression. How do we make almost creative expression a right because it's a social tool? Thank you. And Lesoko's comment seems to be um, gesturing in that same sort of direction and maybe picking up what I've thrown down, which is struggling with this idea of arts activism um, and questions around its utility and what it places at stake. Um, yeah, I guess instinctively I want to do the thing that <laughs> as theater practitioners are, are, are quite prone to doing, which is, well, it's performance, right? It's this kind of beautiful utopian thing that allows me to kind of inhabit the space of the other. And, you know, the, those are very, I think, simple, perhaps overly simple ways of thinking through what we're doing when we're performing. Um, and I wonder if there's a way of deepening that inquiry a little. Sure, we are being alerted to, you know, subjects in their locations, and their similarity with differences to us. But much like the circle suggesting, I'm wondering what there is beyond that kind of immediate function that we, we automatically assume theater or performance or creativity is always already fulfilling, which is opening our awareness towards the other. There, there are lots of questions there, so so I'm going oh, to. Oh yeah, gonna, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I'm going to start off if I if I can, Phoebe and Yaliwe, and then perhaps you can jump in at, at some point, just to to speak to your your questions, Mbogeni, around um, kind of the hierarchical structures within we within which we operate, and you know this this project is re is framed as a research project, you know, and the grant. Um, the funding comes from the UK. It comes out of Goldsmiths. So the 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 the, the, the pr uh, principal or primary investigators are from Goldsmiths University, and and so you know, and it's a fantastic fantastic project. And it's 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 given us three years to three to four years to really engage. Um, it's quite a kind. Of, I think it's given us the time and space. To engage with the people who we who we've been working with in this instance the sweat and with with sex workers to form a sex workers theater group and but that having said you know the project has a lifespan and mm. which is dependent on funding and in fact the project is is drawing towards a close and initially the idea was to get us to a point where we could launch an independent sex worker theater company, a first in South Africa. Um, and yes, that still is the plan, that still is the dream, but you know, we're not quite there yet. So the big question for me, and I guess it's, um, it's an ethical question really, what, what happens beyond this research project? What happens to the, the sex worker theater group beyond the research project? And, and so, so it's, you know, it's, 
yes, we're kind of trying to figure out ways of ensuring that it continues and that it's housed within sweat. Um, but there are all sorts of things like funding uh, that will, you know, that we need to ensure the the the, the kind of the ongoingness of the project. Um, but essentially, as as academics, as practitioners, our role, myself, Yaliwe, and Phoebe, in the project comes to an end at the end of this year. You know, so it's a, it's a kind of an ethical, and then in a way, one goes on to the next research project because that is what the university mm. requires of us. That's what the hierarchical structure requires of us. So, so you know, I I find myself kind of faced. I find that I'm in a little bit of a dilemma. But I think Phoebe has has a has an alternative view, which I think when we were in conversation the other day really helped me to think through this. So, so Phoebe, I'm going to hand mm. the baton over to you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Sarah. But uh, yeah, indeed, uh, um, Bongeni and everybody else raises key issues here around contradictions. <laughs> Give me a context or space that we're working in without contradictions, you know, knowing that um, uh, we are all embedded in various hierarchical power structures, you know, capitalism, uh, uh, gender inequality, um, uh, racism, and yeah, now we have the university and the NGO dynamic <laughs> at play in relation to research and um, uh, research funds coming from the West. So there's a lot of um, contradictions and um, uh, interesting power dynamics that, you know, um, are displaced but uh, re um, uh, assert themselves in various ways. But uh, speaking to uh, the question of sustainability um, uh, that has been thrown at me, um, <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 um, having closely watched, uh, and for me, uh, I'm a gender studies scholar. Uh, this was my first encounter with theater and performance. So it was an incredibly, incredibly learning curve uh, throughout the entire project. And having uh, closely observed or interacted or being uh, part of the group of uh, three years, um, uh, noting the kind of work we do, and uh, indeed Sarah and I have uh, written a couple of articles around this, is um, in relation to the question of sustainability, um, I would like to uh, call on Jackie Job's notion <laughs> that she works with in relation to um, and building culture, um, uh, uh, culture elements uh, with the kind of work she does uh, that engages the body and uh, with that kind of um, interaction, it interrupts inherited um, uh, culture um, elements uh, such as, uh, you know, related to structural inequality. And with that, I point to the element of healing, um, which is very much embedded within the kind of work we do. And this is uh, uh, something uh, that will remain uh, with the theatre group um, as a material means that they can draw on, or with the, uh, the theatre group members as a material means that they can uh, draw on moving forward and does not necessarily um, uh, play within the framework of uh, finances. Uh, or money uh, or economic aspects within which we root and locate um, uh, um, sustainability. So going back to Jackie Job's um, notion of unbuilding cultural epistemologies, that way one is producing new epistemologies in relation to uh, what it means to be a sex worker and living on the street and how to navigate that in a way that um, deals with trauma which is an aspect that's gravely neglected um, given the circumstances that, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the circumstances, you know, the human condition <laughs> as a result of structural inequality that has placed sex workers in the margins. Uh, so yeah, these new epistemologies live on in the body. Um, and that's my way of looking at this element of sustainability as opposed to, you know, the, um, uh, um, yeah, the economic aspect in relation to that. Mm. Thanks, Phoebe. Lesaka, I see your hand. I'm going to circle back to you in a second if you would just give me a moment. 
Um, yeah, I, I love that we've, we've landed in this place of sustainability and this question. And, and what I'm hearing, the suggestion here is that there are two kinds of tracks that we tend to think about uh, sustainability in terms of, right? There's the institution which demands deliverables, outputs, research papers, in our field, a play here and there. Um, but perhaps what the suggestion here is maybe we need to begin thinking about sustainability along other routes that behave, perhaps remain invisible within the kind of capitalistic institutional framework that, that kind of codifies sustainable things in terms of the reproducibility of products, right? Um, I know that one of the things, you know, and, and Phoebe touched on it uh, around work that Jackie Joe was doing with this crew, right, where she's using Bouteau to impart not just a kind of technical exercise on how to move through the body, but they're working to philosophize, for want of a better word, right, what it means to be in the body and engaging with all these politics while they're doing it. So I wonder if there's any profits in thinking about the intangible, I guess, um, things that we're doing in performance as perhaps the place where we find a version of something we might call sustainability. Because the performance may end, the intervention may end, but what they're left with more than just skills is a critical apparatus that they can deploy in other scenarios and in other spaces in their lives beyond just the moment of performing in the theater. I'd like to come back to that idea at some point. Yes, sir. Mm, uh, sorry, I, I realized I was talking over you. Sorry, I realized I started speaking while I was muted. Um, whew. This is a um, uh, this is a trigger warning, like <laughs> this whole conversation around um, activism, artivism, and the sustainability thereof is is a trigger for me personally, um, because on one hand I believe that to be an artist is to be an activist and does not need to be overstated, is that to do this kind of work is to do activist work, is that to attempt to conscientize is always to be an activist, right? But there is a, a facet of, of practitioners that calls themselves this specific thing. And I think my prior question was asking, what does that mean? What are we actually doing when we call ourselves artivists or activists or when we speak of creative activism or whatnot? all of the words, there are many words for it, but what is it actually? And what is the desired outcome of it that sits outside of just being an artist? Because my frame of thought is that being an artist is already doing that work. So there is that, that is a struggle for me. The second thing is, um, and it points to this question of sustainability as well. And uh, Camille, Please, please correct me if I say your name wrong at any point. Um, Camille also speaks about this, is this idea of romanticizing our art and um, overplaying the hand of our art, so to speak, but also stretching the hand of our art beyond its limits. I think we, we take our art and we put a particular kind of pressure on it to do something that it maybe cannot do. And maybe that's not its job. Maybe it's not meant to do that. Maybe it's not meant to activize as opposed to conscientize. Maybe it's not meant to incite as opposed to make you think. Maybe it's not meant to, but I think this idea of arts activism or uh, I hate all of these words, so I'll always keep coming back to them. <laughs> um, I think this idea puts a particular kind of pressure that is about a doing outcome, that is about an actioning beyond the moment of impact, beyond sharing space and communing in, in exchange and in thought and in sharing. What Phoebe talks about this, we have left something real and personal and moving with the sex workers that they can always take with them is freaking powerful. And that is what we do. But I think that this idea of activism or what, whatever, those buzzwords that I keep using, um, I think it takes away from the work that we do, which is the work of the soul. And there is a soul thing that happens in, 
in this exchange. I've seen quite mm. a few of those split productions um, and, and some friends have even directed these works. And I think the conversations I've had with individual sex workers one-on-one -on -one after those productions have been monumental. But because we put this pressure on the art to do this thing that is beyond its scope, which is to activize in a particular kind of way, I think we neglect the actual work that this work is doing, which is making humans experience humanity and sit in a human experience together, right? Um, I don't know, I'm rambling now, so I'm gonna stop. Um, but I think there's a thing there around activism or activity, activity, let's use that word, uh, because they have the same root. Activity yeah, versus actively engaging. Camille is clapping um, because he and Jehan also in the chat are on the same sort of thread, and 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 I I absolutely feel the you know um, the point that you're making because I was wondering the same thing. To what extent are I mean to use the word gently are our anxieties around what our art is doing and our anxieties around its value more perhaps about our anxieties around how intelligible that value is to people beyond ourselves and beyond the people whom the art is engaging with. To use Camille's word, ego, right? Um, I would start by saying, stop calling it our art. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I come in here? I just wanted to Sorry. respond to Lisejo. So Lisejo, hmm. I, me and you, we're on the same page. You know, I this, this binary that's set up between you know what is now called applied theater and theater like mm. what is it it's all theater right and it sits somewhere on the continuum and it, it's all about some kind of shift in in one in the performer in the self and in other and 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 whether it lands or not we don't know sure so i i completely agree with you and just to be a little bit anecdotal when we started the project that it, i was initially asked if i would get come on board to work on a with foreign theater. And I said, no, no, we don't. This is, let's, I, I agreed to include participatory in the thing. So participatory theater and performance, but, you know, and, and the training itself, for example, you know, Jackie Job was mentioned. We included Bhutto as a, as a, as a modality, for example. So, and so I am completely on the same page. I think, and maybe Yaliwe can come in at this point. I think that the term creative activism is comes it's something that sweat has has named that they do right as part of their activism which is a very much activism and label it is activism right around mm. decriminalization destigmatization and so my understanding that there's some kind of coming together of of because Sweat as, as our NGO partner is an active partner in this coming together of the two. And I, I think, I think it's, it's def definitely necessary. And I think it's something we need to challenge, but I think it's kind of come out of that. And, and maybe Yaliwe mm. can, can add to that just now. But the other thing I wanted to say, uh, you know, I think, now what did, what did I want to say? Something about the, what Phoebe was saying and, 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 you know, how can we, how do we know what what you were saying and what Camille was saying is how can we you know how are, are we tr expecting too much from this thing this art this this art of ours you know but mm. I think for us it's been quite you know in the project we have like every time we meet we have a check in and a check out and there's a lot of checking in and checking out we have a an arts therapist who works with the with the, the group regularly and over and over again. Um, this idea of, of how the, the work has landed in the bodies of, of the, the sex workers who are part of the sex worker theater group is, is that there has been some kind of shift. There's been some kind of different understanding of, of the body and how the body navigates this world that is grossly unfair and grossly unequal. So, so, so I think a lot of the yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how one, you know, how one measures success, but I think a lot of the, the reflections speak to this. 
So yes, what Phoebe is saying, there's a, you know, the things that live in the body, the, the resonance of, of the work that we've been doing over the past three years is in a sense, um, speaks to this uh, notion of sustainability, but a different kind of sustainability, not necessarily something mm -hmm. that it is can be monetized, you know. But Yaliwe, do you want to come in just because you have a longer history with, with sweat around this notion of creative activism? Longer history with sweat, yes. Not the notion of creative activism. I think uh, <laughs> I, I learned from sweat what they think creative activism is. And, and, and coming back to the point about institutions, right? Which institutions are we embedded in and, and what's mm. the background ontological framing of these institutions? So if you look at the NGO sector and the way it has evolved, it's very much about setting up an institution. Uh, and from a feminist perspective, I see more and more, it's a liberal feminist kind of, you know, sitting too comfortably within a utilitarian kind of, we do this, there's individuals who work together to achieve that, to change that in society, quite linear and structured, working very much within legal discourse. Uh, that's very dominant in, in, in liberal, liberal feminisms. Um, and sweat is there, right? So sweats have a labor rights argument <laughs> about sex work is work. It's a labor rights argument. And, and it's mm. very much reliant on legal discourse. And it's very mm. much reliant on a perception of social justice that relies on individualism, right? Even though in fact, they are articulating other things, but their official narrative is that. And when they're talking about uh, uh, using what they have came to call creative activism before I met the, 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 the framing creative activism is about using working with ways of communicating this message they have about decriminalization of sex work outside the way in which NGOs usually do it. Now, how do NGOs usually do it? <laughs> we hold workshops, we have uh, campaigns on social media, we have pickets, you know, we have what goes on. And I'm saying we, because I'm, I also see myself in that sector. So what's happening? So it was that framing of creative activism, looking at how to be alternative from the perspective of the NGO sector, which for me in this articulation is a liberal form of feminism around sex work and then saying, how do we do things differently? And then come in the idea, like how do we be create, how can we be creative in this form of activism, this form of the idea that we can change society through these roots, legal reform, for example, mm -hmm. which requires destigmatization. So even the version of destigmatization Sweat is talking about is about the kind of destigmatization that would enable parliamentarians to say, yes, we can de De, we can we can decriminalize sex work so there needs to be an understanding that sex work is like any other any other profession that requires you know that needs to be protected as a form of work uh, uh, that needs fair working conditions these are the words that you know so this is where that framing comes from lesego and from me who knows nothing about that or knew nothing about performance arts you know I, I look at Sarah and I sit in those sessions and I'm like, okay, it's been a huge learning curve for me because then I've been able to see myself in this NGO-like institutional framing and, and, and see the limits of the discourse that, mm. that we have and also the limits of the ways of being that we have that do not deeply engage with embodied transformation, which is what I've experienced and seen that this this is a radical embodied uh, uh, shifts happening, whether or not decriminalization happens, right? And, and that's, 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 that's so, so, so institutionally we're, we're shifting narratives or maybe not getting stuck. So, you know, the, uh, and then you come as a researcher looking to, to, to think and talk about this in intellectual discourse. And that's another, you know, that's another combination of words and framing that we, we're grappling with. And, and Sarah and Phoebe has writ written amazing articles. You know, what does this mean for social change, radical social change outside the framing of legal discourse that Sweat has? Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Um, 
<laughs> the word radical has come out bad. <laughs> it's 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 pricking my memory of last week's conversation, where I very lazily and perhaps inelegantly threw out a term in trying to kind of grasp for a way of framing what I believe maybe we desire from this way of working. And I talked about perhaps this planetary outlook, this reaching for possibility for plurality might emerge out of what I then called a radical intimacy, right? Um, which I've been trying to make sense of since, but but as I'm sitting here and, and remembering, firstly, my own work with um, Sweat and the workshops that I taught, which are based in kind of um, release method movement as a way of developing performance ease, but also understanding relationships around balance and weight and all these things. That's something to how I was working with them. And beyond the kind of intimacies or closeness that being in a room with people affords you that you're necessarily going to encounter, I think what I mean by radical intimacy is that you enter into a relationship with one another's lives that you are open to extending beyond the immediate moment of the encounter. That you're intimate and it's radical in that you're engaging in a level of intimacy perhaps or a level of familiarity, maybe that's a better word, right? With people with whom you would otherwise not be intimate anyway. And I think that's the radical turn there. Is that so much of what we do ends up staying here within the immediate publics that we move through comfortably. And maybe, maybe what is of value in this work is that it opens us up to that radical moment of allowing ourselves to be intimate with the other um, when we would not have been otherwise. And again, it's not as a way of consuming them and owning them entirely and kind of locking them in your vision of who they are, but in really seeing and in the practice of the kind of performance field itself is in the doing and making of work together and sharing space physically. There's something about that level of intimacy that I think is distinctly different and initiates or, or, or kind of mobilizes perhaps a, a different kind of ethical orientation towards the practice. That's I hope. You're muted, my darling. Sorry, all very exciting to me. Um, I love this idea of radical intimacy. And um, I'm always, my um, practice is always trying to think through institutionality and uh, always inevitably being bound to institution and thinking through institution as discipline because discipline is a, a, a result of institutionality. Understanding disciplines and specialties is a result of institutionality. And I think the, the thing that I find really provocative about this particular project is the way the interdisciplinary comes together, is mm. that it's this conversation around sex work and um, ethically, talking about it, ethically speaking to it, ethically engaging with actual sex workers, ethically engaging with the topic of sex work. It's, it's about a particular kind of ethics. Um, and I like that it happens in the soul, on stage with the actual humans who practice this work, that is one frame, and that it happens in the courtroom, and that it happens in parliament, and that it happens in the academy, that all of these kind of streams of, 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 um, of trying to make shit right are happening together in one project. Um, I think that's very, very, very generative as a model for how we practice this arts activism or creative activism or whatever is that my work me sitting in a room on a stage and working with my actors and making a work that is beautiful and wonderful and then sitting outside of that room and, and having an intimate round table discussion with my friends who exist in the world that i exist and therefore think in similar ways and even our tussles are in the same vein that we can move away from that by exercising this kind of interdisciplinary approach. Um, I think mm -hmm. it's, an, it's incredibly generative. And 
uh, I think it was Sarah who was saying success is a tricky word and it's a tricky thing to think through. But I think mm. that is the success of, of this project is that it doesn't just happen in one space. It's happening in multiple mm. spaces in conversation constantly. Um, and that not only one discipline is leading the trajectory of, of the movement of what the project is trying to do. I think that's really wonderful. Yeah, and this is definitely the turn that I was thinking about towards, right, so if we reject for a moment this, this I'm going to say capitalistic notion again, um, of success being quantifiable in products, in measurable outcomes that institutions love and that funders love and NGOs love, um, then what are the opportunities that we might be missing um, to really take the impact of the work we do seriously? when we stop measuring impact in terms of these quantifiables. And I think, as you've pointed out, Lisekho, and, and other people have as well, there are plenty of opportunities and possibilities and moments that emerge as soon as you stop thinking about success in, you know, sometimes language escapes me. When we, when, when we stop thinking about the success of a particular project or a moment or an intervention in terms of, again, the metric, right? Something quantifiable. There's something far more slippery and, and perhaps intangible um, and less easy to grip onto, but that is eminently more generative that sits beyond that immediately visible kind of um, set of, of quantifiable kind of marks, right? Around what we did. That is, is very exciting. And Camille asked a question here. Um, yeah, you were speaking about uh, what it means for a community to be embodied. And I think this, this, this question of embodiment is, is one of those things we miss when we're looking for the ones and the zeros and you know, the slips of paper and all these other things, is the things that are happening in the flesh um, are vital and they're important. Because all the histories, all of the theorizing, and all the everything comes back down to the matter of the flesh that we move in and through, um, that we can never ever retreat from. Um, again, like you, Lisa, I find that incredibly exciting. Um, was there another hand that I saw a second ago that I possibly missed? No. Um, there's a question for Sarah from Jehan. Um, and he's asking whether there are any new dynamics that have emerged from the Global Grace Project um, about collaboration across institutions and perhaps opportunities again for changing the hierarchical powers that structures that do exist. And if I might also expand that question out a little more, not from Global Grace necessarily, I'm wondering about our friends in the room who may not necessarily sit within institutional structures and, and how you know, that view from another perspective might inform our thinking here. Help us poor institutional <laughs> people figure out our way through this mess. I'll answer that, but I think Yale has been asked a question by Camille as well, right? Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I, I, I gestured towards so it. They never actually. Yeah. And then I'll and then I'll answer it. So I'm, let's let's go to Yale hmm. first. Yale, hmm. That's okay. Yes. So the question is um, what it means for for community to be, for that community to be embodied? What's an example in that world? How did you identify that sense of embodiment? Yes, if I could um, just, just, follow up that, just to make sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm, like you, you, you made the point about the uh, feminist kind of from where your perspective is, what were the results, yeah. the outcomes that you could actually point to? Yeah. How do you, if you, I mean, is this an art project, literally? literally trying to explain exactly how a community has been embodied over the course of a time period? Or is it something that you can actually give evidence for? You know what I mean? Like, is there something you can talk about to talk about how that community has been embodied? And even if it mm. didn't have the results you were expecting? Yeah, it depends what you mean by embodied. Eh? How does a community become embodied? Um, I mean, my thinking about embodiment is actually the physical body of the sex workers in the theater group and how they speak about the use of their body, breath, movement, you know, and then speaking from that breath and movement. And then their stories come that create the script. And, and they remember the ways in which those movements, uh, 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 those collective uh, uh, 
uh, created movements by a facilitator, somebody teaching them like Jackie Job, you know, really, uh, 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 they felt a shift in their body. They felt some change in their body, but they also felt some change. Uh, um, they felt uh, that they had addressed something in that was sitting uncomfortably in their body, but also in their memory and in, in terms of how they, they process what happened to them, the kinds of things that happened in childhood. Uh, come, I mean, we had one production that really, um, and, and Jackie Job's uh, Buto was part of preparing them for that production, but also Iman Isaacs, is it, uh, you know, a physical theater where they told the story of from childhood through to adulthood, how it is they got into sex work, some of their memorable moments. And, and, and that was a very powerful piece. Um, and the way in which uh, 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 that process of developing those pieces they get to see each other and process perhaps trauma sitting, uh, uh, pain sit, that sits uncomfortably in the body together. And that's a shared memory mm. that uh, we were talking the other day with Mbongeni and Sarah and Phoebe, that that's also something that uh, remains with them. This shared memory, the, the memory of sharing those stories and creating together is something they can draw on and they have a community in which they can do that with beyond the end of this funding. It just means mm. they do need to find a way to physically get together to do it, but mm. maybe not. We also had online platforms at, at some point, although quite tightly facilitated. So the, I guess there's various layers of embodiment there. So embodiment, physical body, embodiment, community, embodiment, mm. the way in which memory is shared communally with bodies getting together and then creating, you know, and that community gets created, I guess that's, is that a version of community, embodied community? I'm not sure. Hmm. This is not a word I use very often myself in my writing. So you're pushing me. <laughs> I'm writing it down. Yeah. You know, thanks, Elira. And, and just to add to what you were saying, um, I think thinking from the body first, for me means that you can't ignore in a kind of Marxist materialist sense, right? Um, the facts and conditions of living. Um, thinking from the body first means that I have to recognize that the body is in a context, it's in a location or a place or a space, and it's in or out of that place or in or out of time, right? Um, to acknowledge the body is to acknowledge flesh and to recognize in some ways that all utterances, whether they're spoken or utterances of a different kind, emerge from the situated being who is always in relation to other bodies. Even standing on my ace on a desert island, right? My relationship to others is constituted by their presence or absence. So bodies become about relationality. They become, or thinking through the body becomes about relation. It becomes about um, location, about context. And, and one can scarce, I think, say anything beyond that without recognizing that if one is speaking about through uh, or manifesting the body in some way as a concept, um, you're enjoined to also recognize the context that makes those bodies intelligible. Maybe? Can I add to that? I mean, yeah. I think, yeah, you know, I mean, I, you, you said what I was going to say, that it, you know, it's, it's the re relationality or the relational aspect of, of, of the way we work in theater and performance for me that opens up the space for, for what we term in thinking from the body. And, mm. and for me, it's, 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 it's about, you know, I think that, that, that the sex workers we work for, we work with, are, I mean, through various experiences, we're working with traumatized bodies, bodies that, that hold a lot of trauma that have been violated, you know, over and over again. Police brutality is, is common, you know. And I think one of the things, it's a, so then there's a disconnect from the body that emerges from those experiences. So I think what, what you know, the way in which, which we work in theater and performance and is about connection and possibly reconnection to felt perception. 
So the feelings mm. in the body and kind of coming to terms with how the feelings in the body are almost, it's like, are the drivers of expression. The feeling is the thing from which our, our stories or, or the expression of our stories emerge, you know. So I think, I mean, I, my particular work with the, with the theater group is around breath. I have, I'm deeply invested in breath and how breath can connect us with our felt perception and how breath can connect us to the stories that live in the body and assist us in finding ways of expressing those stories through the body. So the body is central. And, and for me, it's about reconnection. Mm. reconnecting with a body that I think a lot of the, the participants have disconnected from. I, I, I mm. would say, yeah, mm. just to add to that. And Lesaho makes a really important point here about uh, the body being stigmatized. And indeed, uh, because the body is deep criminalized and stigmatized and is on the margin, there's a singularity <laughs> Um, in existence, that this is the main focus. Whereas, you know, this kind of work then um, moves that into multiple vocabularies in relation to what the body is or what the body can do or how they see themselves. So indeed, um, it's a great comment there, Lisa. Mm. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> so many things firing off in my head. Um, I guess, <laughs> It's, oh, we're five minutes to the hour, which means we've got 15 minutes left in this part of the session. My question is the after party where we hang out afterwards. Um, Jehan, your question to Sarah. Okay. Do you want to rephrase it? It's there in the chat. Right? Yeah, it's there, Jehan. Yeah, it is, um, it is, it is, I think we're at a point where we don't necessarily need to yeah. have the formality of raising a hand. By all means, go. Have at it. Is this a, uh, the conversation with Mark and Mandela? Um, the, the previous conversations we've had have all been talking about this is constantly this conversation about a much more rhizomatic sort of way of thinking about things. Um, mm -hmm. And I just want, and when I look at the Global Grace Project, I went through the website, et cetera, I see a much more rhizomatic kind of structure. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that you spoke about the institutional hierarchies that still are inherent in that, but maybe that's the first time around. I'm just thinking if I was to imagine new institutional, what Amy is, who isn't here talks about, like, you know, is there a way we can start jamming in a way like institutional devising? You know, we talk about devising as theater makers, but can institutions, uh, you know, uh, different kinds of institutions start to devise together to create a new kind of entity. And so, uh, I mean, so, so what do you what do you think you learned from the Global Grace Project thing that maybe could be a next step or a new iteration of that or something? So, so on, on, on multiple levels, I think there've been many, many moments of kind of creating or opportunities to create new dynamics, as you put it. And I think that the first is, you know, this, Within UC, the University of Cape Town, we have two different um, departments within a faculty working together, but two departments that work very differently, particularly around um, research. And I think Yaliwe has alluded to that a little bit. So, so I think that it's been an invaluable experience for both, um, for all three of us, for Yaliwe, Phoebe, and myself, to engage um, with each other and, and ways of, of working, particularly around research. So, I mean, I, my paradigm is, is, is practice-led research or practice as research. It's very embodied, right? And, and, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> Yaliwe and Phoebe, but the kinds of research that you do are more within a, a, the, the, the kind of paradigm of, or the frame of, of social sciences, right? So kind of social science frame, yeah? So there's been an interesting, uh, conversation between us as researchers in the project. And in fact, I found um, it was two years ago, we, we, we had a, a, a gathering in, in Brazil and I was speaking to the ideas of practice and research as research. And it was quite a, a, a revelatory uh, way of doing research for many people in the room. And for me, it was like, oh my gosh, but this is how we do things. This is how we do research in theater and performance, and I was like, which I had just taken for granted, you know? So on one, on one hand, it's, it's kind of, it kind of validated um, the kinds of work and the kinds of research we do within our discipline with, that locates within a broader university. 
Um, and we always kind of say, oh, the performing and creative arts are sort of, we, you know, we, we, it's, we were kind of a little bit precarious because, you know, funding is tight and maybe we'll be the, the first uh, to go if they cut, cut uh, funding and departments. But actually, no, what we do is vital. And can and so it, it opens up possibilities for for interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity within this the university structure. So for that, for me, that has been very exciting. And maybe uh, you know, and just the coming together of of just a, a practical example. You know, Phoebe mm. and I going away for two days. We wrote an article together, and it was incredible because there were these this coming together of. Of very different paradigms, but we found a way of making it work, and it just—I it, it, felt I also kind of it started to engage with another lang way of languaging and another way, another frame. But it, and finding how these two could converse with one another was a was a very productive experience. So I think on a very protect, uh, practical level, as researchers, for me, it has been there've been amazing dynamics, new dynamics that have emerged. Mm. In terms of the, the the relationship, you know, this project, I think the Global Grace project is is a very um, what what drew me to it when I was asked to be part of it, is that every project has an NGO partner who is a partner in the project. So you've got your PIs, your primary investigators, or not primary, yeah, primary investigators, co-investigators, and NGOs and postdocs on the project. So there's this community of researchers and practitioners working on the project. So for me, that was another, another way of kind of um, challenging these hierarchical structures. And, and so, so how the academy meets the, the NGO world, you know, two very different kinds of hierarchical structures. And, mm. and, and um, that, you know, I think that kind of trying to find the meeting point there has, has been very, very challenging. Um, very, another very practical example, you know, when we rehearsed on our campus, the, the security on the campus were very, very hesitant to allow the sex workers onto campus. And they called me and I said, no, I'm doing a project. You know, <laughs> we're working together in the bindery lab, you know, but they were like, so it was like, oh my gosh, you know, how, how can we allow these people onto the campus? And I was like, oh my God, you know. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's challenged. It's challenged on multiple levels. Uh, and I think there's something that Singer was alluding to too. These, these oh. kind of hierarchical structures and research and, and how NGOs work and how you know, universities work and, and how creativity or arts or performance fits into all of that. Um, yeah, so I think that it has challenged in many instances. It's challenged this notion of research because, you know, what is it? Is it engaged research? Is it engaged scholarship? What, you know, what is it? And is it, is it, yeah. is it more valuable? Is it less? So I, I think it's, um, it's 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 challenged quite a lot uh, on multiple levels, and I don't know Phoebe and Yali if you want to add to that. I do. I I I'm going to go from that very very quickly. I'm sorry. You know this 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 I um the sense that yeah there are these these institutional challenges that or, or certainly opportunities right for reimagining or jamming as um Jen was saying right um is is imagining kind of different institutional formations, if not the dissolution of institutions entirely. Um, that point also kind of connects back to what we were saying about embodiment earlier on. And what I'm thinking of now as this kind of apartheid of knowledge is, in some ways, is that institutions value a particular kind of knowledge. And so going back to the idea of the body, the other thing that I think is, is um, important in recognizing certainly what performances focusing our attention on the body as the kind of reservoir of knowledge is exactly this idea that I think Gloria Anzaldua called it theories in the flesh. Um, the sense that the doing and living or the practice of living is always and already a way of theorizing as well, right? I'm making knowledge about the world through the very doing of the practice of living. It needn't be reduced to an academic text or, you know, 
appear in a journal or even on stage under the sign of proscenium art, right? Where it acquires the value of an art object, something to be looked at. The very practice of living itself, if we attend to how people inhabit their everyday worlds, how they negotiate their relationships to one another, is a site of knowledge and a vital one, right? Um, and that is theory in the same way as the text I have next to me that's published by a great publishing house. So to the extent that we're thinking about a kind of institutional critique, um, there is also something emerging here, I think, in the recognition of the validity of knowledges that aren't immediately visible to institutions and the structures that they, they kind of privilege. Um, yeah, I I also think that there's something. Sorry, Camille, was there a hand? Did I interrupt your hand? Okay, that was a that was a yeah. Cool. Um, <laughs> I also think that there's something so incredibly interesting about this way of working, um, which is practice as research. So my biggest um, struggle with practice as research as it's conceived of in the way that I've engaged with it within performance studies um, is that it's actually just reflecting on practice in theory, right? It's just writing papers about work that I've made. Um, and I think what this work is doing is it is pract it is using appropriating in inverted commas performance methodology for research. It's not about making performance. It is about using performance to do something else entirely, which I think is so interesting because A, it gives validity to performance studies as, as a discipline. It says performance studies is not just us liking to make work and then, you know, writing about our work. It's that, um, our methodologies are able to reflect on the broader world and broader ways of living in productive ways, which I really enjoy. Um, mm. I, 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 and I like, Sarah, that you, you speak of it in terms of practice as research. I, I, and I think that what I would say it is, is that it's actually practicing research because you're not reflecting on oh, the like performance that. that they're making. You're not reflecting on what the performance did, what the performance didn't do, the lighting was like this. You, you're not reflecting on the, the, the maker's outcome or the performance outcome. You're reflecting on its impact on something else. And I think that is it. And that is where we need to start thinking about going because it is such a valuable way. It is another lens of thinking through the world, right? It is as valid a lens as psychology. It is as valid a lens as sociology or anthropology. And we have such clear language that has already been kind of established. And so why not use it? Because the language is there and it's also beautiful language. Yes, Camille. Mm. Yeah, I, I, was gonna, I was gonna ask too, just to put a little button on what Lesoga is saying right now. I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, there's something about that that final aspect of knowing that it has had impact that can't be quantified in the same ways that might be anecdotally expressed without actually there being some sort of expectation for the next time or the mm -hmm. next situation. And then and we're talking about an ecology that's being created, right? And maybe that's the language we should mm -hmm. use when we talk about outcome. We're trying to create an ecology that may take five, 10 years to even build. And it might be a way of being able to talk about that in stronger language than we can when we, you know, when we're writing grants to talk about outcomes, the things that we don't really care about in terms of industry. Um, it's just something to think about as far as just whatever we're doing, right? Thinking about being able to try and find language that's different and actually challenges institutions to be able to come up with ways of being able to think about that, right? We give them examples or anecdotes about this or that, and then the institution has to go, wow. I haven't thought about that before because all I'm used to thinking about is how industry gives us the results that we're used to getting. Um, yeah, just something to add on to that if it, it makes any difference. 
Um, it makes a huge difference. Um, sometimes the simplest formulation that will completely shift something. I think you seized on committee to something huge here, this idea that what we're, maybe what we should be thinking about is producing or languaging it in a way that we recognize that what we're producing is an ecology, not an outcome. We're producing a set of systems, um, an ecosystem perhaps, where things can happen um, rather than outcomes. We are creating scenarios for things to happen rather than the things themselves. Ah, that's, that's gold for me. <laughs> that is, you know, um, yeah, uh, we refer to Java as an ecosystem engine. So Jayhan's also just noting that the, he refers to the Java school in Mumbai as an ecosystem engine. This is this is gold for me. Um, know that my next funding application is not going to use, use the word outcome at all. <laughs> I'm interested in producing ecologies of, right? Um, yeah, that's I, I, I'm finding that deeply attractive conceptually, um, precisely because it I think manages to do what I was trying to reach for earlier on, is de-emphasize products, de-emphasize outcome, de-emphasize the quantifiable, and focus on the production of spaces of not necessarily equality, because that sounds a little like, you know, touchy-feely for my liking, but certainly spaces where we can meet one another and recognize one another and recognize our mutual positions in relation to one another, how we're oriented towards the world we share. And hopefully something, no matter what it is, comes out of just that practice of sharing space together, seeing one another. And maybe that's enough. My artist's ego maybe wants more, but there really is poss possibly something about the practice of being together. It's that radical intimacy again. It's coming back in, in interesting ways. Was that, uh, was that a hint you have? No, I love it. Cool. Um, I guess now's as good a moment as any to segue. We are 13 minutes past the hour, which means that we are a minute away from the formal end of the session. But as we know, the after party continues. Um, so please feel free to hang out, turn your mic on, grab a drink if it's nearby. It's evening for me, so I might try and get a glass of wine. <laughs> Um, and let's definitely keep this going, especially because we've now seized onto something that I'm going to obsess with for a while. Thank you for that offering. <laughs> so I need to uh, just say, uh, stay tuned next week. Uh, next week is me, right, guys? I believe it is, yes. Yeah, so we have uh, Ellen Lauren and J. Ed Ariza, who uh, run the city company in New York, um, and they are coming in at an a nice evening slot, a morning slot for the US, 7 a.m. and an afternoon evening slot for us. Um, and so, yeah, so that's Falguni's got this and the announcement is there. And it, the conversation, the pre-conversation has happened and it was such fun and I can't wait for you guys to, 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 to listen in. But they, they have mixed both the work of uh, the Suzuki company of Togo and the work of Viewpoints, um, and they have, uh, they've worked across cultures and across spaces and they're just exciting people about trying to think about the fact that theater seems to have the tools that could heal the world. And it's just a question of how do we make those tools much more ubiquitous. I just wanted to say, Umgeni, Mwenya, me, Amy, we all have had the luxury of being uh, in all of these conversations. And so our brains are sparking like mad and we are at this oh. space of impulse and all. And, but if there's anything that the, one of the things we're thinking about, which is a question to you, and we want to throw, throw it out to you guys who are listening in uh, and who've been coming into all these conversations. Um, but is any of this causing change in something you're going to do next? Because where does this, this impulse from all of this, this energy of thought and, and ideation and articulation here, how does it transmit into the next thing you do in your practice? Or, or we all do in a collective moment, which might be another, um, you know, a bridge too far for now, but we'll get there. But just mm -hmm. something we want to just throw out to you guys is, are you thinking about what do you, you know, what is this cause that might, how has this become an intervention for you? You know, just shift something ever so slightly. And so just think about that and see where that 
uh, leaves you because I think that's something we're going to build up to as we go into the next uh, nine remaining talks. So by the time we get to the 10th talk, it's going to be really, uh, well, what are the actions we are going to take uh, in terms of uh, going into this unrehearsed future? So I'll leave it at that. And I think that is where we can indeed stop the recording. Thank you one and all. The after party is officially on.